torture chambers, secret passageways, vats of acid, and deadly vaults. In 1895, Chicago police unearthed horrific evidence of torture and multiple murders at the sprawling castle of H.H. H. Holmes. Masquerading under the guise of caring doctor, kind husband, and prominent businessman, H.H. H. Holmes was a contemporary monster, designing his buildings solely for the disposal of human bodies. Torture doctor, monster of 63rd Street, H.H. H. Holmes was America's first serial killer. Just south of Chicago, the suburb of Inglewood was thriving with commerce. The train station itself had nine leading lines of railway and over 100 trains stopping there every day. No other suburb of Chicago had this luxury. Dr. Henry Howard Holmes, a pleasure to meet you. Arriving in Chicago, Holmes finds work immediately at the E.S. Holton Drugstore located at the southeast corner of 63rd and Wallace in Englewood. Several months later, Everett Holton dies of supposed natural causes. Then Claire Holton, his wife, disappears after selling the drugstore to Holmes. Owning the drugstore, Holmes had a steady flow of cash. He would often purchase and resell goods and properties under his numerous aliases. In addition to scamming creditors, Holmes obtained his funds from other phony inventions, such as a mineral water elixir, which in reality was obtained from the city's water supply. 1888, Holmes secures a lease on the vacant property across the street from the drugstore, the southwest corner of 63rd and Wallace. It is here that Holmes will make his horrific dreams come true. He will construct a building for which the entire world will remember him. Fantasies start very young, and so what he did then was he took a step further in of his fantasies to make it reality. And, and probably, if we had done a little bit of an investigation back then, we would have seen things like his plans, but not just plans for a building, because we'd expect to see architectural plans, but plans for his torture rooms. For the suburb of Englewood, the building Holmes is erecting at 63rd and Wallace is a massive construction project. Day after day, passers-by stop to gaze at the spectacle of the many laborers working together to create a magnificent new edifice in their neighborhood. Englewood residents were so impressed with the massive building that they named it the Castle. From its outward appearance, it seemed rather normal. But like the duality of homes, the exterior and interior of the building were extremely different. Holmes himself was the architect of the building. He was the only one who knew its design. There was this constant turnover of workers on the building. He would hire a mason to put in a wall and then fire the guy, or hire somebody to put in part of a staircase and then fire him. And uh, there, there seemed to be several, several very sinister reasons behind that. One was he managed not to pay a lot of these people because he was always claiming that they were doing incompetent work. But the other, much more insidious reason was that no one except him really had a clear idea of what the structure of the interior of the house was. He had a huge bank vault installed in one of the rooms. And the way he did it was he put the vault in first while the building was under construction and then built the room around it. And he bought this thing on credit and then refused to pay for it. The bank company said they were going to repossess the vault. Holmes said, well, you know, come on in and do, but if you damage my building in any way, I'm going to sue you for everything you're worth. The bottom floor of the castle housed a pharmacy, jewelry store, barber shop, restaurant, and a blacksmith shop. Behind this innocent facade was a gothic house of horrors designed by the mind of a monster.
The third floor seemed innocent enough, containing rented rooms, legitimate offices, and Holmes's own bedroom. But it was the second floor that contained 35 rooms, many specifically designed as killing chambers. Disorienting unsuspecting victims, the labyrinthian construction contained numerous staircases and doorways that led nowhere. For a quick method of hiding a victim's body, a concealed greased chute and trapdoor led directly into the basement of the castle. basement held the most terrifying rooms, resembling a medieval torture dungeon. Acid vats, quick lime pits, and a crematorium disguised as a glass-bending furnace were Holmes' favorite methods of immediate body disposal. After cleaning and mounting their bones, Holmes would profit from his victims by selling their skeletons to local medical schools and universities. Holmes would make a killing in Chicago, financially and literally. May 1st, 1893, the world's Columbian Exposition is open to the public in Chicago. Spanning 600 acres, sprawled out along beautiful Lake Michigan, the magnificent fair is a monumental sight to behold. Over 20 million people from around the world would attend the dazzling World's Fair between May 1st and October 30th, 1893. Holmes utilizes the World's Fair as the perfect opportunity to capitalize on his demented design of the castle. Located only a few miles from the World's Fair, Holmes's castle was perfect lodging for tourists. Holmes decides to rent rooms to visitors of the fair. He entirely renovates the upper floors of the castle, bringing in the most modern furnishings and luxuries, all purchased on credit which Holmes had no intention of repaying. In addition to placing newspaper ads for rooms to rent, 
Holmes visited the fair with several of Benjamin Peitzel's children, preying on elderly women who flaunted their wealth, making sure he invited them back to the castle for a warm night's stay in a soft bed. They're not calling their relatives, telling them where they're at. They just know that they're going to Chicago to see the Columbian Exposition. Perfect victims, because they're unknown in the city. Their relatives, wherever they came from, know that they were coming to Chicago, and they never came back. Now, how do you start to find them? They don't even know where they stayed. Perfect, easy victims. I'm sure some of them got in and out of his place with no problem. And others, they walked in and they never checked out. Some of the rooms had been completely lined with asbestos to make them soundproof. Hidden in Holmes's office was a master control panel which connected to gas lines leading into airtight sleeping chambers. Holmes would lead his victims into the rooms, lock them in, and turn on the gas asphyxiating them while watching their demise. Let me out! Holmes, let me out, please! Holmes! Holmes! Holmes, please! Holmes! At the height of the World's Fair, Holmes masterfully juggles his castle businesses, renting rooms, dodging creditors, selling skeletons, and attending to the needs of the many women in his life. I have had many young ladies in my employ, most of whom are still living in and about Chicago, whose parents and friends know only too well that far from being their seducer, I have done much to materially help them in their narrow lives. Being a personable, attractive young doctor and businessman, Holmes won the hearts of many women throughout his life. At one point, Holmes managed to secretly have three wives each never knowing of the others. In 1890, Julia Connor became Holmes's employee and mistress, living at the castle with her daughter Pearl. When she became pregnant and demanded marriage, Holmes agreed on the condition that she allowed him to perform an abortion on her. She agreed. Neither Julia nor her daughter Pearl were ever seen again. Just a week later, Holmes sold a clean, articulated skeleton to the Hahnemann Medical College for nearly $200. In 1892, Holmes acquired another mistress, Emmeline Sigrand, and employed her as private secretary. Holmes sent Emmeline into the vault to retrieve some papers and sealed it, suffocating her to death. Several weeks later, the University of Chicago acquired a female skeleton from Dr. Holmes. In 1893, Minnie Williams became Holmes's new private secretary and eventually his mistress. Minnie was the beneficiary of a property in Fort Worth, Texas, valued at over $40,000. Holmes murdered Minnie and her younger sister, Nanny, after having Minnie sign over the Fort Worth property to him. In 1894, Georgiana Yoke became Holmes's third wife. He married her under the name Henry Mansfield Howard. Like his other legitimate wives, Georgiana lived out her entire life. On July 19, 1895, Chicago police enter the Holmes Castle. The world would now learn of the horrors that the castle had kept secret for so very long. As disoriented detectives and police search the upper floors of the castle, the true depths of Holmes' evil were waiting in the basement.
Among the death devices in the basement of the castle, investigators find piles of mixed human and animal bones, bloody women's undergarments, and a wooden dissection table saturated with dried blood. Chicago police were inundated with names of people reported missing from the World's Fair. Fifty missing people were eventually traced to the Castle of Horrors. The evidence, blood and bones found in the basement posed a problem for 19th century criminal investigative techniques. It was very difficult to go and identify even the bones as being human in origin because with the very small fragments you didn't have enough of the identifying characteristics to be able to make that ID. The world is now calling Holmes the monster of 63rd Street, torture doctor and the modern Bluebeard. Overnight, Holmes transforms from arch swindler to arch fiend. A Chicago journalist calls Holmes a multi-murderer. The Holmes case generated this incredible amount of na national attention, and really international attention. Really in his own time and in America, Holmes was much more notorious and more widely known than Jack the Ripper, who was a contemporary of his. Then as now, people were very, very fascinated to sort of visit the sites of these terrible crimes. And his castle became a kind of tourist site. And there were various people who were going to, wanted to take it over and turn it into a kind of murder museum. And then, just before some impresario was about to make it again into this tourist attraction, it just burnt, it burnt down. Somebody burnt it down. I mean, it could have been, who knows, some outraged citizen who didn't want this to become some very morbid tourist attraction. Holmes' trial was kind of the O.J. Simpson trial of the day. It just generated this huge amount of publicity. The case had become a kind of national obsession. Of course, there wasn't CNN or Court TV back then, so it couldn't be covered quite as relentlessly. But it was covered very, very extensively. There were true crime books and pamphlets and all kinds of stuff. And Holmes himself had become a sort of folk figure almost, you know, the sort of national boogeyman. courtroom fills for the final verdict to be read. Holmes becomes extremely nervous when not one of the jury members looks at him. In his entire criminal career, this is the moment Holmes never believed would occur. He is found guilty of murder in the first degree. Herman Webster Mudgett, alias H. H. Holmes, would be hanged on May 7th, 1896. was in jail awaiting the execution of the sentence, he was made an offer by William Randolph Hearst, uh, supposedly for a significant amount of money to provide his confessions. Holmes, who had already issued at a half a dozen completely self-contradictory versions of, of his crimes, clearly at this point felt he had nothing to lose. He was going to die anyway. 
In this confession, he did a complete about-face and portrayed himself as the worst monster who ever lived. He just basically confessed to every crime anybody had ever suspected him of and threw in a few more for good measure. He's reliving the fantasies after the fact now. He's reliving the fantasies of things that he did. She was very willing to do this and prepared to leave the vault upon completing the letter, only to learn that the door would never again be opened until she had ceased to suffer the tortures of a slow and lingering death. The partial excavation in the walls of this room found by the police was caused by Latimer's endeavoring to escape by tearing away the solid brick and mortar with his unaided fingers. I closed the door and turned on both the oil and steam to their full extent. In a short time, not even the bones of my victim remained. It was the footprint of Nanny Williams that was found upon the painted surface of the vault door, made during her violent struggles before death. Only one difficulty presented itself. It was necessary for me to kill him in such a manner that no struggle or movement of his body should occur. I overcame this difficulty by first binding him hand and foot, and having done this, I proceeded to burn him alive by saturating his clothing and his face with benzene and igniting it with a match. As soon as he had ceased to breathe, I cut his body into pieces, and by the combined use of gas and corn cobs, proceeded to burn it with as little feeling as though it had been some inanimate object. I immediately took them to the Vincent Street house and compelled them to get within the large trunk, through the cover of which I had made a small opening and ended their lives by connecting the gas with the trunk. Then came the opening of the trunk and the viewing of their little blackened and distorted faces. Then the digging of their shallow graves in the basement of the house. The ruthless stripping off of their clothing and the burial without a particle of covering save the cold earth. I am convinced that since my imprisonment, I have changed woefully and gruesomely from what I was formerly in feature and figure. My features are assuming a pronounced satanical cast. My head and face are gradually assuming an elongated shape. I believe fully that I am growing to resemble the devil. gallows. Just before he died, he recanted. He claimed that the confession that he had published was a complete fabrication. The extent of my wrongdoing in the taking of human life consists in contriving the killing of two women that have died at my hands as a result of criminal operations. That is all I have to say. H. H. Holmes is hanged on Thursday, May 7th, 1896, just nine days before his 35th birthday. At 10.25 a.m., he is pronounced dead. He was very concerned that after his execution, his body would be dug up either by medical men seeking to dissect his brain and find out what made him tick, or, or just ghoulish sort of you know, souvenir hunters, and he requested that he be buried within a big slab of concrete, which he actually was. One of the things about Holmes is that nobody knows for sure how many people he actually killed. 
Um, although in my researches, which were pretty, I feel, thorough and, and extensive, it, it seemed very clear to me that he murdered at least nine people. There have been stories that he killed 50, 100, countless people, particularly in Chicago at the height of the World's Fair. How many people did Holmes actually murder? Most likely, no one will ever know. Holmes and the many other people that came in contact with him are long gone, having taken the answers with them to their graves. I was born with the devil in me. I could not help the fact that I was a murderer no more than the poet can help the inspiration to sing. I was born with the evil one standing as my sponsor beside the bed where I was ushered into the world. And he has been with me since. What's up, my people? It's Joe Morello here with another podcast talking about the beautiful thing that we like to call murder. As ever, I'm joined on the show by my wife. Hi, Michelle. Hello, Joe. Hello, listeners. What wicked delights do you have waiting for us on the coroner's slab today, Joe? I'm glad you asked that, Michelle, because we're going to go deep with this one as we talk about the Shoe Shine Killer. A new killer on the block. <laughs> and we have a cameo appearance from your friend and mine, Manny Sherman, the Beast of Arkansas. What a lineup. That's right. This is a case that's going to blow the listeners' minds because I believe, and I'm just putting it out there, that maybe, just maybe, local law enforcement got this one wrong. Sounds like a great show. You got it. But before we dig a little deeper and get to the juicy bits, I want to introduce a very important character in this story. FBI Special Agent Hector Monday. Hmm. Let's take everyone back to Wednesday, January 15, 1997, when Chester Bell of the FBI reported how Hector Monday and his team had apprehended the beast. Good morning to you all. I'm Chester Bell, Assistant Director at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At approximately 0530 local time, a team led by Special Agent Hector Monday and supported by law enforcement officers conducted a raid of a motel room just outside Birmingham, Alabama to apprehend Manny Sherman, the man known as the Beast of Arkansas. Using state-of-the-art psychological profiling techniques, Special Agent Monday and members of his task force not only identified their suspect, but predicted his movement with unerring accuracy. Hi, people. It's Joe Morello here with another podcast talking about the beautiful thing that we like to call murder. As ever, I'm joined on the show by my wife. Hi, Michelle. Hello, Joe. Hello, listeners. What wicked delights do you have waiting for us on the coroner's slab today, Joe? I'm glad you asked that, Michelle, because we're going to go deep with this one as we talk about the Shoe Shine Killer. A new killer on the block. <laughs> and
and we have a cameo appearance from your friend and mine, Manny Sherman, the Beast of Arkansas. What a lineup. That's right. This is a case that's going to blow the listeners' minds, because I believe, and I'm just putting it out there, that maybe, just maybe, local law enforcement got this one wrong. Sounds like a great show. You got it. But before we dig a little deeper and get to the juicy bits, I want to introduce a very important character in this story. FBI Special Agent Hector Monday. Hmm. Let's take everyone back to Wednesday, January 15, 1997, when Chester Bell of the FBI reported how Hector Monday and his team had apprehended the beast. Good morning to you all. I'm Chester Bell, Assistant Director at the Federal Bureau of Investigation. At approximately 0530 local time, a team led by Special Agent Hector Monday and supported by law enforcement officers conducted a raid of a motel room just outside Birmingham, Alabama to apprehend Manny Sherman, the man known as the Beast of Arkansas. Using state-of-the-art psychological profiling techniques, Special Agent Monday and members of his task force not only identified their suspect, but predicted his movement with unerring accuracy. I'm delighted to say, we have our man. Now, I've got something here that's going to put a different slant on this case altogether. What is it? I've managed to get in my possession extracts from the interview sessions between Agent Monday and Manny Sherman. No way! How do you keep getting hold of stuff like this? I have my sources, but I can't reveal them. Not even to you. These tapes are being played for the first time anywhere in the world outside the actual interview room. Are you ready? I think so. Play the tape. Manny Sherman, born January 1, 1956. Come on. You know all this. What do you want? What's this? Huh. You've been doing your research, haven't you, Special Agent Monday? What are my favorite television programs? Describe my first pet? What were your friends like as a child? What is this? You're taking a survey, you're trying to learn something. Would it kill you to be direct? You wanted to know what inspired me? As if I wasn't an original? Well... Maybe there was one man I found myself a little fascinated by. Henry Howard Holmes. Why? Because he was numero uno. America's first. The guy invented the trade. He set the benchmark, you know? Learn your history, Monday. Read a book. You think because I stuck a blade in some people and get off on it, I'm not smart? I, uh, allegedly killed 13 people before you got smart enough to find me. Oh, that was disturbing. Did you hear the way Manny spoke? I mean, he was like channeling every sick psycho you've ever heard of but he saved the best for last. None other than H.H. H. Holmes himself. America's first serial killer. The very same. Let's play the next tape. I had to build my own little castle, just like Holmes did. Most people like me do their business where their target lives. That's just asking to get caught. Holmes had the right idea. It's all about the honey trap. You bring me some smokes, like I asked? Lucky Reds? Yes! Oh, these are like gold in here. Damn, that's good. So, yeah. The honey pot. Holmes built a hotel about a mile from the World's Fair. 
and called it the World's Fair Hotel and bought ad space and papers alongside ads for the expo. Rubes from far and wide assumed it was the official hotel. Come on, Pa Kettle. Take a train in from Nebraska. It takes three days. They roll up into that joint ready to rest, get to their room, and whoops. What do you know? Holmes had a gas pipe hidden under the bed and poisons them. Or maybe he pulls a trap door on them. Maybe he separates them and makes one watch through a window while he slits the other's throat. That's the advantage of a honeypot. No shortage of targets. <laughs> That's why I picked all those houses north of the airport. The whole neighborhood was scheduled for demolition, and yet, all those lovely realtor ladies must not have gotten the memo. Call up as a contractor. Tell them I'm flipping. Have them meet me out there. And look at that. We're the only two people for miles. The first couple times I wait for a plane to fly over just to hide their screams, but after a while I realized they could scream as loud as they wanted. No one was gonna hear a thing. That's what I remember most. Those screams. You can try to understand why I am the way I am. You can forensic science up all the data you want, but you'll never know. You'll never know, Monday. You'll never really know how it feels when you watch the fire burn out of somebody. After capturing Manny Sherman, our man Monday was suddenly the hottest ticket in town. He couldn't go anywhere without someone wanting to throw a case his way. Everyone loves a winner. Let me lay this out for you. On September 3rd, 1997, the local PD found the mutilated body of an unidentified man in his early 50s behind an apartment block in the South Loop District of Chicago. Then, two weeks later, another body washes up on the East Pilsen River with the exact same modus operandi local law enforcement realized they were dealing with a serial killer. They needed help. So in the late fall of 1997, Agent Monday found himself in the Midwest heading up an investigation that would soon become synonymous with his name. Let's hear from Field Agent Danny Haywood on his first impressions of meeting with Agent Monday. I first met Agent Monday on October 12th, 1997 at O'Hare Airport when I was assigned to welcome him off the plane. I'd actually met him once before at a lecture on criminal behavior given a few weeks prior here in Chicago, but I doubt he remembered me from that. I was pretty nervous as the new kid on the block. I was just out of training and I'd been assigned to drive around this big shot criminal profiler who just cracked the Arkansas case, which was all over the national newspapers. My first impressions were that he was tall. You hear that, Michelle? <laughs> Actually met him once before at a lecture on criminal behavior given a few weeks prior here in Chicago. That puts Monday in Chicago at the time of the original killings. Exactly. Okay, dial back a few weeks to the summer of 1997. Agent Monday is in a tiny interrogation room in Birmingham, Arkansas, conducting his psychological investigation into Manny Sherman. But he's doing more than that. He's picking Manny's brains, learning from him, being challenged by him. Let's play tape number three. <laughs> a whole carton this time. You trying to get on my good side or something? Yeah, well, uh, I think I'll save him. What, no questions? What's going on with you, Monday? Well, you seem different. Ah, <laughs> I see that glimmer in your eye, you little devil. I can keep secrets, man. We all have them. 
That prosecutor is trying to get numbers out of me. You know that? Of course you know that. Numbers. They got Holmes for 27. But we know he was closer to 200, right? Can you imagine that? I wish I'd had the time to try and beat that. Sure, they know about those nice realtor ladies. They got families, after all. But the numbers the DA is asking me about? I think he knows there's some people out there, rejects, misfits, the kind of people that when you see them coming, you look the other way. Does anyone notice if they go missing? My father always told me to leave my mark on the world. I never knew what he meant by that. Not until I watched that first girl bleed out. I call it art. That's my signature on society. It's not murder. It's an aesthetic response to what this world has made me. Ask people to list serial killers, and they'll drop five, ten on you before they can think of any more. Ask them to name the detectives that caught those killers. No one is going to say a damn thing. No one knows. No one cares. No one makes movies about them. No one puts their faces on t-shirts. No one gives a shit. <sighs> I've left my mark on the world. Have you? Holy shit! I did not see that coming. I told you this stuff was good. Where did you get this material? Sorry, I gotta protect my sources. But, Michelle, I've got more evidence you haven't heard before. My source has given me autopsy notes from the coroner as she examined the second murder victim. John Doe, number two. I'm assuming you've read my report on the first one. Similar MO, unidentified male with multiple stab wounds. Looking at the lower abdomen, the wounds are consistent with those of the first victim. The shape of the entry wound suggests it's a strong probability that this is the same murder weapon. Looks like we've got a souvenir hunter here. This time the left ear has been severed. Clean incision. Probably a scalpel or a razor blade. Very tidy. Nice job, actually. Very little bleeding. The deceased had probably been dead for 30 to 40 minutes when this was done. This differs from the earlier MO. If you remember, that John Doe was still alive when the teeth were removed. That would have created a lot of noise and mess. This guy is learning. Oh my god, that's gruesome. Right? Investigating violent crime is gruesome. It's stressful and it can get to you. Agent Monday started seeking professional help. We have here a transcript from one of the sessions Monday attended with Dr. Isabella Garcia. Michelle, will you grab that piece of paper over there and read it for us? Sure. Psychological assessment conducted by Dr. Isabella Garcia. Patient name, Monday, Hector. Behavioral observation. Hector arrived at our scheduled appointment 24 minutes late. Once we sat down and began the session, he struggled to maintain eye contact. He found it difficult to articulate his feelings and was terse and guarded throughout. Hector has been working long hours and as a result, isn't sleeping well. Hector spoke about his recently deceased mother and displayed evidence that he hasn't yet fully come to terms with her death. I strongly recommended a course of antidepressants, 
but he is resistant to this idea, believing that it would have a detrimental effect on his capability with regards to his current investigation. Hector describes his work in immaculate detail, and contrary to earlier in the session, his thought content is both coherent and logical. He is displaying an unhealthy obsession with his work, but his recent bereavement may be the underlying issue. So what do we know? Agent Monday is at his lowest point. He's struggling with the case, and he's being guided in his actions by a convicted mass murderer. This one is really going to give our listeners something to remember. It's the fourth and final meeting of Agent Hector Monday and the Beast of Arkansas, Manny Sherman. Hold on to your hats. This one is going to get tasty. You want to know what it means to be a killer? You ever been to the art museum downtown? They got this painting by a guy, I forget his name, famous painter. He did portraits of slaughtered cows hanging on hooks. You take a normal person to a slaughterhouse and they will puke their guts out. You make it into a painting and suddenly it's art. There's no difference between the two. Not really. Don't look at me like that. You know I'm right. You get it. I know you get it. You got to do something that matters. Make people feel something they've never felt before. Shatter the illusion that any of us are really in control. Think of the most profound thing you've ever done. The most beautiful thing you've ever created. And I promise you, it's nothing compared to watching the life bleed out of someone. To see the fear in their eyes. To feel them pawing at you for release. To hear them pleading, begging. That moment when someone realizes they are at their end. That's when you feel it. That's true art. That's what you have to be, an artist, a sculptor, an architect. I see the gleam in your eye, Agent Monday. You're not fooling me. Look! Ah, oh, look at you now, huh? Am I gonna be your first? Well, come on, then. Huh? I'm right here. This room is soundproof. You don't even have to wait for a plane to fly overhead. There you are. I see you now. Oh. can feel good, huh? But the blade makes for such a prettier picture. Uh, you've got potential, Agent Monday. If you truly want to be an artist. Monday flipped? And what was all that stuff about being an artist? That's how Sherman saw himself. He was a killer. Which is why we covered him in episode 117, Michelle. Okay, just listen to this. On June 17, 1998, neighbors reported hearing screams coming from Agent Monday's apartment. I've managed to get hold of the actual audio from the body mic worn by the first responder who answered the call. Chicago Police, Mr. Monday, this is Chicago Police. Can you open the door, please? Mr. Monday, I'm Officer Stanley with Chicago Police Department. Can you hear me, sir? Agent Monday. Fuck. Fuck. Oh. Uh, dispatch, this is Officer Stanley. I, I need assistance at 8 West 50th Street requesting immediate backup. I'm in Agent Monday's apartment. There's, there's blood everywhere and, and a body. I need immediate support. I think... Oh, oh, Plot twist. 
So Mundy was actually investigating his own murders. He was the shoeshine killer. I bet you didn't see that one coming. Did they get him? You're racing ahead now, Michelle. Let's hear the moment Officer Richie Martinez cornered Agent Monday. All units, this is dispatch. Be on the lookout for a male suspect believed to be the shoe shine killer. Suspect is FBI Special Agent Hector Monday. He may be armed and is highly dangerous. Dispatch, this is Officer Martinez. I found Monday's car, requesting backup. Officer Martinez, what's your location? A warehouse on Park Avenue, Fulton River. Looks abandoned. Officer Martinez, back up on its way. Hold your position. Copy that. Shit! He's seen me! Officer Martinez, hold your position. Oh. Ah. Ah. Shit! We have a situation. Dispatch, the building's on fire. Fire department on their way. He's still in there. You read me. Copy. He's still in there. Monday got sloppy with his car? Maybe. Or maybe Monday wanted that police officer to find it. Well, I don't get it. He knew the roads were being watched. His car would have been pulled over the moment he left the city. So he needed another way out. Let's hear how Chicago AM reported events in their morning bulletin. Good morning, Chicago. We begin today with some breaking news. Chicago police today confirmed the body of a man found in a fire at an abandoned warehouse in the Fulton River District to be that of missing FBI agent Hector Monday. Monday has been identified as the shoeshine killer whose recent killing spree struck fear into the hearts of locals in and around Chicago. A spokesperson for Chicago PD confirmed Monday murdered four victims, including yesterday evening police officer Patrick Stanley, a dedicated veteran of 22 years. The fire was brought under control shortly before 5 a.m. this morning. The body recovered at the scene was burnt beyond recognition, but police identified Monday from dental records. So, that was the end of Special Agent Hector Monday. Whoa, hold your horses. You think it's so difficult to forge dental records? Monday was a teeth puller, remember? He probably had a collection. And he was a highly motivated FBI field agent. You think he faked his own death? I don't know. But this case has one more twist. On February 16, 2001, there was an incident at the Chicago PD Evidence Management Facility. Michelle, can you grab that report next to you and read it out for our listeners? At 0600 hours, I, Officer Frank Hooper, discovered that one or multiple individuals had gained unauthorized access to the evidence room at 1612 West State Street. Among the missing items were assets recovered from the apartment of former FBI agent Hector Monday, including books, clothes, notes, surgical tools, and dental equipment. Wait. Keep reading. We are currently running with the theory that this was the direct result of souvenir hunters looking for a piece of memorabilia from the case. End of report. Interesting, right? He set the whole thing up? In that list of stolen items, reportedly, was a piece of paper with a list of names. Aliases? What are you saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm just putting it out there. You think Agent Monday is still at large? <laughs> well, if he is, maybe he can call into the show and let us know. Our lines are open. Well, that's all we have time for for this podcast. We're taking a short break for a certain anniversary trip next week. But we'll be back after that for more murderous content to delight you all. Until then, this has been Michelle Morello. And I've been Joe Morello. Thank you for listening. Please like this podcast and hit the subscribe button or I'll send Michelle over to brutally kill you all. I have an axe at the ready. This is Joe Morello saying be safe, don't split up, and keep looking behind you. Good night. Good night.